There they lie, just off the city centre. Shaped by nature, landscaped by men. This is Bukit Brown Cemetery. At rest are the country's forefathers, whose collective timeline span 150 years of our development into modern Singapore. Their tombstones are touchstones in living memory for a new generation of descendants. This is our history from the hills. When Raffles first established Singapore as a trading post, the British conducted trade with certain members of the migrant community who gained their trust. Among them, Tan Tok Seng, whose eldest son became one of the leading rice merchants of that time, establishing close ties with Thailand. Today, Sri Koman from Thailand is taking the opportunity while on a business trip to visit the tomb of Singapore's first Consul General to Siam, Tan Kim Ching. With her are Ronnie Tan, who is a descendant of Kim Ching's brother, Tan Tae Kwan, and Lim Soo Min, who, like Siri, is from the Tan Kim Ching line, in her case, by marriage. And you used to come here when you were small? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the uh, grave is up there, uh -huh. up on the hill. You know, my, my husband and mother-in-law, they tried to look for this grave many years ago. Difficult. Yeah, unless they, they you, couldn't find it. Unless someone brings you, you yeah. know? Yeah. Coming to Tan Kim Ching's grave for the first time is a very emotional experience for me because actually our family has been trying to locate this grave for many, many years. Um, my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, they had gone to Shangi many years ago because they, they uh, were told that the grave was there. And then when they uh, discovered that it had been moved to Bukit Brown, um, they also came many years ago also. Uh, but because it's so vast, it was difficult for them to locate the grave and they were not successful. You notice the two dragons? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. One dragon uh -huh. Uh -huh. over here. Uh -huh. It represents the uh, head of the Chinese community, uh -huh. Capitan China. Uh -huh. And here, in fact, it's written here uh -huh. England Capitan. And this uh -huh. one is the Thai title. Now, the Qing Dynasty's title that he bought uh, uh -huh. is down here. The rest, I think, this refers to Russia and Japan. Oh, that he was yes, representing. because he was also consul yeah. for Japan and Russia. Yeah. Like his father, Tan Tok Seng, Tan Kim Ching was a Capitan China. Right from the days of the Malacca Sultans, you are the lead merchant. I appoint you the leader and I'll deal with you on all matters to that community. So that was how the Capitan China system then arose, where from the days of the Malacca Sultans, one, the most prominent Chinese merchant, was selected to be the unofficial informal leader who then layers with the Portuguese or the Dutch or the British on all matters relating to the community, including matters of judiciary matters here. Tan Kim Ching made his fortunes from rice mills he owned in the region, including Vietnam and Siam. People move freely from one to the other. Then. The king of Siam says, I want a representative in Singapore. Instead of sending somebody there, uh, you are trading with me very well. Uh, Tan Kim Cheng trading in Bangkok regularly and so on. So why don't you represent my interest in Singapore? So the British have a, the, the consul, of course, is just a title. These are words coming from the Europe. Uh, there were other words in the past in, in Malay or in Thai. Just the king's representative, you know. He took as his second wife a lady from the Thai court, Kun Yin Pun, from whom Siri's husband is descended. Kim Ching had a noble title. Uh, he was known as Praya Anukun Sayamkit, uh, which is a high level title. And King Mongkut um, trusted uh, Tan Kim Ching a lot. He wanted his children to be educated uh, in the English language and to be educated by an English governess. Um, and he actually asked Tan Kim Ching uh, to recommend uh, an English governess. And that was how, you know, Anna Leonowens was introduced to the court of Siam. That became the King and I, the movie, the musical. 
At rest on another hill at Bukit Brown is another Kapitan China, one who hails from what was once the Dutch East Indies. This grave belongs to my maternal grandfather, uh, Wee Chim Yen. My mum used to tell me, oh, uh, your grandfather is uh, Kapitan Mangale. For many years, I was trying to figure out what is a Kapitan Mangale. Is it Mandalay in Burma? Or... Until recently, I learned about this word called Kapitan China. And we thought that he was a Kapitan China in Singapore, looking after Chinese and so on. But it turned out he was, he was a Kapitan China in Sumatra, in a place called Bengkalis. Bengkalis is on the uh, east coast of Sumatra, facing Moa, across the Straits of Malacca. And he inherited the Kapitan China post from his dad, Wei Leong Tan. This date means Wee Chim Yen's tomb will have to be exhumed to make room for the new highway. Looking at the burial register is one and a half plots. And the uh, sculpture around the tomb uh, apparently is from a kind of gravel that is not found locally. And because of that, the sculpture could be done in a very uh, thick form, thicker than most of the local gravel could, uh, could sustain. So the, the figures actually come out and they can withstand time. They don't chip away, they don't fall by themselves. To me, it signifies that this is a, a person who was very respected. Firstly, it's a large plot. Secondly, the kind of uh, statuary. And also from the inscription, you can see the connection to Holland. Because there is uh, two Chinese words there that says He Kuo. Here in Singapore, we were already back in those days uh, very international. We have relationships with Malaysia, we have relationships with Indonesia, and also with Dutch Holland, with uh, Britain. So it's not that today we become global. We already were a global city. Even though Singapore may have already been global in its early days, its aspirations were precedented by another city up north. Mosaic is widely used in traditional Chinese architecture for decorative purposes, especially in temples. This cut-and-paste technique is a highly specialized skill prized amongst the southern Chinese migrants and valued by the community. Malacca was where many of Singapore's prominent pioneers came from. Wherever the Chinese immigrants went, they brought with them their gods. Their new home was always landmarked with a temple. Ching Hun Teng, the Temple of Green Cloud, stands in living memory of their devotion. It was believed to be built in the early 1600s by the Kapitan Chinas. In 2002, the temple garnered a UNESCO award for restoration. A descendant of the Kapitan China who undertook repair and added extensions to the temple in 1801 had a major role in the restoration. A member of its advisory committee, Zhou Chua is a direct descendant of the Kapitan China Chua Su Chong, eight generations down his line. The temple, before you go into the prayer area, you have this big Bai Pian, the plug. You will see Yun Santi, and that's his writing. On the left, you have his name also. I was very proud to find that I had some connection with this temple and that my ancestor was uh, partly responsible for you know, certain sections of the temple being built. This is a different temple from a lot of other temples in that it was first managed by the Chinese capitans. So, so far we've been able to trace about 10 to 11 Chinese capitans. Etched on the steelies in the temple are familiar names of pioneers who came from Malacca to Singapore. Chiang Xiang, Tan Jiak Kim, Gan Eng Seng, among many others, have all contributed funds to Cheng Hun Teng. Tan Kim Cheng, the son of Tan Tok Seng, and he donated 500 big yuan for the restoration and uh, renovation of this temple. Bukit Brown was not the original burial ground for Tan Kim Cheng. He was reinterred from a massive grave sited in Changi. Oh, yes, this is the original grave at Changi. Changi. Yeah. yeah. And uh -huh. you can see it's the yeah. same. So much more elaborate. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. those old days, you can see they had so many of these statues in front. Yes. In, in fact, um, I, I brought some, you know, Thai elephants 
um, to pay respects to Tan Kim Ching's tomb, just mm. like he had elephants there before. Yeah. In Thailand, this is mm. you know, to pay respects uh, to our ancestors. Mm. Tan Kim Ching's eldest son had died before him, so this tombstone was erected by his eldest grandson, Tan Bu Liet. Bu Liet's name is here, mm -hmm. Bu Liet. Huh? And these are all his sons. Mm -hmm. huh? The sons, the headed, first son is Qi Chuan, mm -hmm. the eldest son, yeah. eldest daughter, Ching Niu, mm -hmm. Ching Ge Niu. Uh -huh. huh? so, and then there were mm -hmm. six mm -hmm. other sons mm -hmm. and eight other daughters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your grandma is here, Chun Niu. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I understand my grandmother was the youngest of yes. all the, of the girls. Chun Niu, Chun Niu. Yeah, the youngest. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why he's on the age. Yes. We have a lot of photos of uh, Tan Chun Niu, grandmother Chun, uh, and her husband, uh, grandfather Bao. Um, uh, and, you know, obviously taken in Singapore because there was one in which they were in a car that had a license number, the license plate was S8. There was a house in the background that obviously they stayed at, uh, but we didn't know whose house it was. Uh, it wasn't until quite recently <laughs> when we put um, those photos up on Facebook that uh, Facebook friends, Norman Cho actually, uh, identified the house as a sea breeze. We discovered that the house um, belonged to the Cho family. He was married uh, to a Tan Tok Seng um, descendant. Tan Tok Seng's roots are in Malacca, in St. John's Hill at a Dutch fort is the grave of his father, Tan Guat Tiong, who first made the journey from Fujian province to Malacca. OK, this is actually the father of Tan Tok Seng, you know, and uh, my relationship with them is that Tan Tok Seng's um, granddaughter married into the Chi family, and my grandmother was a daughter from that family. Malacca, one of the earliest Malay sultanates, was conquered at the turn of the 16th century by the Portuguese. Then the Dutch took over, but it was the Chinese who made their first foray with the ships of Admiral Chen He 200 years earlier. By the time Malacca was ceded to the British in the Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824, there were already local-born Chinese businessmen who not only knew the lay of the land, but more importantly, how to conduct business with the Europeans. And the great advantage is that they already knew a foreign language Dutch. Learning English was not so difficult. In any case, they all used Malay, and everybody used Malay at the time. So between English and Malay, and to, to switch from Dutch to Malay uh, to English is not a big particular problem for them. So they were familiar with European ways of doing things, and the Europeans also felt comfortable with them. William Farquhar, who was appointed as Singapore's first British resident in 1819, encouraged these Chinese businessmen to come to Singapore to seek their fortunes. He himself was a former resident of Malacca and familiar with the Chinese community there. Among those who heeded his call was a group of 36 scions of Malacca. In 1831, they saw eternal brotherhood and called their organization Keng Te Hui, which means celebrating virtue. Membership to the Keng Te Hui is restricted to descendants of founding members. Ronnie Tan is a descendant from founding member Tan Beng Chong. These merchants were about 25 to 30 years old and they had already established themselves in business. We have a lot of uh, our King TV members, they set up business mostly up at North Bo Key. They all knew each other and they would often congregate at the Tian King Temple, which formed a sort of a business venue for business discussions and to make deals. So it was not only a temple, it was also a business center. The temple, be it the Chinese temple, the Indian or the mosque, played a critical social rallying point as a new immigrant trader landing coming to Singapore from Malacca or China or wherever. My first stop would have been to go to the Tian Hock King Temple to pay homage to Ma Tzu for a very safe journey from China or wherever. And then that temple, which became the uh,
base of the Hokkien Association, Hui Kwan, was then my essential welfare connection, my safety net, to which I would turn to for support. Yeah. The King Te Kui, with close ties to Tian Ho King, decided to build their temple, which pays tribute to the Jade Emperor next to it. Built between 1847 and 1875, the King Te Kui building is a living testament to the founding members' efforts and contributions. This title deed confirms the piece of land was bought by the King Te Kui for 500 Spanish dollars in 1844. The members regarded themselves as hiati, that means in Hokkien, the brothers. So they will always look after each other. And that's the reason why they set up a fund. And if any family needed any financial assistance, the King Tegui will come to their assistance. Tiano King Temple was founded with financial resources given by at least about 15 of our members from King Tegui. Giving thanks to the goddess Machu for a safe passage to a new life was one of the first duties of the early Chinese immigrants who arrived in Singapore. Tian Ho King, the Temple of Heavenly Happiness, was built in 1839, and among the top donors recorded was Tan Tok Sing, his elder son Tan Kim Ching, and King Te Kui founding member Ang Chun Sing. Ang Chun Sing was recorded as a manager of the Tian Ho King Temple. Uh, this probably happened after Tan Tok Sing died in 1850. An Chun Sing and a few other shareholders, they set up Straight Steamship Company, which later on was absorbed by Keppel Corporation. Today, however, there is no descendant of Ang Chun Sing in the Keng Te Kui. According to our records, the last member was Ang Hock Siu. He was chief cashier at Straight Steamship. Until today, we've had no a uh, trace of the descendants. Hopefully one day I can find uh, somebody who's related to Ang Hock Siu and who goes back to Ang Chun Seng. The Kang Te Kui's strict rules of inheritance has made maintaining membership numbers a challenge in present times. The Chinese love their flowers. The symbolism runs deep through the course of history. In spring, the peony burgeons wealth and honour. In summer, the lotus unfolds purity and harmony. In autumn, the chrysanthemum blooms virtue over temptation. And in winter, the plum blossoms courage and friendship. On another hill within the city is a single tool. It belongs to one of Singapore's most prominent merchants and philanthropists, Tan Tok Seng. Zoom in and Siri make tracks to pay their respects to the patriarch of their family tree before she catches a flight back to Bangkok. So this is the tomb of Tan Tok Seng. This will be the area where the forecourt would have been, uh -huh. the top of the hill for the road. Oh, I see. On Tan Tok Seng's tomb are the names of his children, the eldest son of whom was Tan Kim Ching. The flag is over there. Okay. So come and have a look at the flag. Yeah. And the flag actually is in two languages. Yeah. And it says that Tan Tok Seng and over there in Chinese mm. who he was and where he came from and what he did and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really been yes. quite a helpful okay. thing there. Yes. And so uh -huh. we get mm. people coming yes. and now they know what it's all about. Mm. So it yes. is Tan Tok Seng. Yes. In 1819, Tan moved to Singapore from Malacca when he was just 21 years old. And from the humble beginnings of a fruit and vegetable store, he grew his fortunes. The Tan Tok Seng Hospital started out as a pauper's hospital, with money donated by Tan. A small museum within pays tribute to its founder. His legacy of philanthropy was shouldered by his eldest son, Tan Kim Ching, who is revered by his Thai descendants. Uh, in our home, we have a room that we call the bone room. Uh, this is where we keep the bones and ashes, a small part of the bones and ashes of all our ancestors. It had always been the centerpiece of our bone room, and so we had always felt that we, we had a connection with Singapore and Tan Kim Ching, and we always wanted to come to visit his grave. It was Suri who managed to track down Ronnie Tan in 2010 through a classmate of hers from when she was studying in Singapore. 
Ronnie brought my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and my husband Woody uh, to Tan Kim Chin's grave for the first time, and it was very emotional for them uh, to actually visit uh, the grave of their great-great-grandfather. And um, this is my first time uh, visiting this, um, th this grave. For Siri, this visit is only the beginning. More still needs to be uncovered about Grandma Chun and Grandpa Pao and the time they spent in Singapore. Siri, a published author, has sketched out a family tree and may one day write the Thai chapter of Tan Kim Ching's life and his descendants. King Tik Hui, 180 years later, is retracing lost bloodlines. The rules on membership succession is very clear. Only the elder son could be a member. That's the reason why famous names like Ton Tok Singh were never admitted as members. We have still about 20 founder members, uh, descendants, and who are still members. And we are still looking for long lost descendants who want to be members and hope they can join us again. As for the Kang Tek Hui Temple itself, it is in serious need of repairs. In the last uh, five or seven years, Kang Tek Hui premises were, were suffering from deterioration. Because the building was put up in 1847, so after about 170 years, the, there was cracks started to show. It was estimated that the cost of repair would alone come to about $4 million. And uh, our members decided that we could not afford such a high price for the repair of the premises. An agreement was signed with the Taoist mission to take over ownership, and its new name is Yi Huang Gong, Temple of the Heavenly Jade Emperor. But Kang Tek Hui members continue to celebrate virtue. To be part of King Tewe is also uh, gives us a chance to serve our fellow members. It's also in a way serving the community. Today, the community continues to be served as worshippers give thanks to the same gods brought over by the early immigrants, housed in temples which had flourished under the leadership of the business elite.